on wire. It would be almost as if a winged messenger had suddenly stood beside her path and held out his hand towards her. George Eliot, Little March. He found me on Twitter, said he'd been following me with interest and offered his help for my next mission. He was writing his thesis on Philippe Petit and wanted to explore the motive of the dancer on wire in a post 9-11 context. I agreed to meet him in Takapuna Library a week before the attempt. I stood for a while by the stacks in the New Zealand section, under F, leafed through a few titles, but felt odd, and moved to a table in prominent view, taking my phone from my pocket for reference. Perhaps I'd misunderstood. It had been a lot to communicate with 140 characters. Psyche? It hadn't occurred to me he'd use my handle. I was about to leave. I have been downstairs, he said, looking around at the empty chairs, and added, Art, 180 to 240, as an explanation. His teeth were stained, a couple were chipped, and his mouth hung open like a teacup. No one ever uses this part of the library, I justified. We're less likely to get told to shush up here. He closed his mouth to smile. His lips were full, if a little dehydrated. Or well, we can go downstairs to the cafe, I said. Yes, there we can comfortably talk. He put a hand on the back of my chair. His wrists protruded from his sleeves by several inches, revealing brown black hairs and the tip of a tattoo. Having let me lead the way until I became trapped in a dance of politeness with an old lady coming out of the lift with her walking frame, Edward jogged around the stairs and was waiting at the counter when I got to the cafe, which is just a few tables and chairs inside the entrance hallway to the library. When we had ordered our coffees, I asked, How long have you been in New Zealand, Edward? I'm New Zealander. It came out quickly. He added, I was born here. I was glad the waiter arrived, and, at the risk of burning, I feigned a sip. Mmm, that's good, I said, and instantly felt ridiculous. It's not too hot, Psyche. Please, Edward, call me. I checked myself, wondering if it was altogether sensible to tell him my real name. Something about him didn't sit well with me. I thought of the unusual suspects and scanned my cup for ideas, but Tetra Pak is no better than Psyche. The woman with the walking frame was now struggling to get the door to the toilets open. I could smell cleaning products. Janola! Call me Janola, I said, inspired. Please excuse me a moment. I got up to help the old dear. When I came back to the table, Edward had left. There was a note scrawled on my napkin a bright torch and a casement open at night. I'd been wise not to give him my name. I folded the napkin, put it in my pocket. I wait for the security guard to complete his circuit of the site, his third and final of the night. His shift will end at daybreak. Each time he's taken the same route. This is good. There are four guards working this site on rotating shifts. The other three aren't as reliable as this one. I'm lucky. I brought my gear earlier in the evening, when the construction workers were packing up. I walked in with a carabiner swinging from a length of nylon web and asked if anyone had seen a black dog. They were more than happy to let me have a quick look, too knackered to care less, though one insisted I wear his hard hat for the search. I didn't say I had one in my bag, pink, customised for a perfect fit. I pointed to the far side of the site, said the dog had got in there through a gap in the fence. That got rid of the guy long enough for me to take some reference shots, let my pack slip from my shoulder and push it under the loose plastic sheeting overhanging what would be a window. It's one thing to walk around a building site with a backpack in the day, with the workmen all about, openly conspicuous, People would assume I'd been doing groceries or was a nerdy student type, just about. But it would be asking to be arrested at this time of night. Without my pack, 
I'm light. Already I have a sense of the euphoria to come, but now I must carry my gear to the top. I'm relieved it's where I left it, if not genuinely surprised. Workmen only notice objects shaped, that, shaped like tits and only care about holes. I take the stairs a couple at a time until I'm 20 floors high. Then my legs begin to burn and I'm starting to sweat. I slow. The east side of this building is virtually all open, waiting for the southern hemisphere's largest panes of glass. I unfasten my pack and take out my gear, setting up the tripod and camera first. There was barely a breeze on the ground, the air thick December. But up here, it's strong enough to suck the camera out and I have to secure it to the steel lintel to stop it falling east. With little light, the initial part's tricky, but once I have the tripod fixed, I can do the rest with my eyes closed. There's a rhythm to the work, an order that feels natural, and it has its pleasure, an undeniable eroticism, but the real draw for me is knowing how the end will feel, the freedom. I rely on no one else for this, yet it's complete. At no other time am I this whole. Once unclipped, the web uncoils itself across the space, and all that's left is to put it in place. I use the water knot of slings, repel rings and carabiners for this. Next, to undress. I need freedom of movement to set the slack line up. Untying the fabric, I begin with the end at my ankle, unravelling myself. Preservation for me comes with the reveal. The sheet, black on the outside, loosens by degrees and falls away. Silver on the inside, I'll position this to reflect the light for the camera. Now there's only me and the work ahead. I work fast, partly because I don't want to get cold, but partly due to knowing these actions so instinctively. Each feed and pull is an extension of my thought, an extension of me. It builds and I increase the tension. Perhaps if I counted, I would discover the exact number of full arm pulls needed to memorise the space, fasten the figure on wire. But each sight is a one-off, never to be repeated. That's its beauty, its thrill. In nature, everything that has beauty is fleeting. The butterfly in her jolting flight is precious not for her colours or her grace, but for knowing such perfection cannot last. The cycle may not end, but the individual act is but a moment in time, and seen by all but the most sensitive of eyes. And so it is for me. The practice bounds confirms preparation is complete, and all that's left is to check the light meter. They call it magic hour, the first hour of dawn when the light is at its purest and diffuse, a moment of brief alchemy when everything on the earth becomes gold, even the concrete bones of this monstrous office block. I seldom get the exposure right. For me, the camera is merely a personal record, a journal entry charting my imperfect flight. Lately, there's been talk of a dawn that rises and never sets. A buzz on the internet. It plays out against the east, defiant, unjust. Flooding the southern hemisphere's largest glass panes. My eyes confirm what I disbelieve. Edward is about to receive a toast. I make my way toward him. The guests part. Mutter, holy, see, as they observe my web between them, overcrowded clay, twittering machine. You lied. He lowers his glass. You are not what you say you are either, bleach. If you knew, why didn't you say? You did a search of the napkin. I found Keats. 
did read page the third. It was two ply. Over the internet search, if you had, you'd have found me. Hawker, a commercial artist, an enigma. Each night, this place is lit with the projection of film. What Edward secretly took. Spying, like Vermeer. Stills of me dancing taken one minute apart, an hour condensed, in sixty frames and played on continuous loops so that the effect is that of looking into a pinhole camera. I'm here every night, magic on repeat. At no cost to the company that owns this building, there are two kinds of free. The light contained in here, as it is on three sides, appears more red. The guests are mesmerised by my naked, pivoting, transparent wire-dancing form. But up on the top of the far wall, like stick arrows pointing west, my shadow flickers and is scanned. I start to spin, unravel the rest of my gear, while they wonder how they fail to spot my entry, then reenact myself, dance and cartwheel in reverse until I'm on the sill. I turn, the casement at my back, clip my harness on, I'm gone. Down in the street, a silhouette looking up at the glass and steel bars, where once the canopies of trees expanded with the calamity of birds, it's easy to see. Only the light escapes. I hear about it later, underway an investigation of sorts. There's an issue with security at that building, they say, and some people would like to interview me, only I'm difficult to describe. My face, one of 140 characters, is my least memorable feature. Society likes to stare, but seldom sees the full picture. The film was stolen, and although it was only a copy, no one's managed to get in touch with the artist for the original. He told me this in person.